it, people? How are you guys doing? So good to see you. Uh, a couple of things first. Um, first of all, I, I want to get a picture of y'all up here because I can. All right. So if, uh, if y'all could just lean in on that side a little bit. I'm going to have to do this multiple pictures, man. This is something else. So I'm going to have to. I am, I am 47 years old. I don't know how to do that. All right. So. But also, what I do know how to do, because I'm, I'm cool enough for this, I'm going to do a first-person uh, pastor preacher view. All right. So that's kind of fun. All right. I've never done this before. All right. Cool. All right. One more smile. Somebody blinked. All right. So perfect. All right. Hey, uh, you'll notice my shirt is slightly two-tone. Um, sweet Emma Barnett back there. Uh, was standing there just enjoying music, having a good old time, and there was a bunch of water trapped in, in one of these linings, and she's just chilling, and then suddenly she's chilling. And uh, like three gallons of water dumped on her, and I was right behind her when it happened, and I'm like, you know what, if you're going to be wet, I'm going to be wet with you, and I just gave her a hug, and so I'm wet with her now, right? So that is, that is why I'm kind of sporting the two-tone. Uh, just it's solidarity. We're two or more gathered, they're wet together. So... Um, Anyway, and also before I pray, it was so cool this morning. Uh, I was down at my study, kind of just thinking through stuff for this morning. And uh, the, the Latino church uses our building on Sunday morning where we meet for midweek in our offices. And I'm in there kind of just looking at my Bible. And all of a sudden I hear a little something out there and it gets louder and louder and louder. And I realize it's like five of the leaders of the church praying for the church, right? And I don't speak any Spanish. You know, I know bad words. I don't know any good words. Um, so I don't speak any Spanish, but all I can hear is C, 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 you know, and somebody's all fired up, C, C, and pretty soon I'm like, C, like, yeah, I, I don't know what you're praying, but I'm excited about whatever you're praying about, man. So we're going to pray this morning, get ready for today. Uh, as we get ready to do that, the kids should have uh, a little kind of follow along note thing. It's a short message today, but they can use that to follow along. If you did not get one of those, you can put up your hand and we'll make sure that we get some to you. So there's maybe some back there. Well, uh, some over here. So there's a couple of places that we can do that. Uh, but uh, I'm going to pray. And, and hopefully as we pray, our heart is see, all right? Because uh, uh, we want Jesus to do awesome stuff in the valley. And it was just a reminder of how he is in so many different little nooks and crannies of our community. It's very exciting to see what Jesus is up to. So let's go ahead and pray together and then we're going to get underway. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that I'm, I'm, I'm back with uh, this awesome group of people that love you and want your best for life. And uh, I pray that our heart, even over the next several weeks, is we're looking at what it means to truly be wise and to be wise in light of you, not just wise as our society may say is wisdom or as culture may say is wise, but wise as your word guides us, wise in the way that your spirit drives us. I pray that what would kind of gear us for all of that is, uh, I always ask, a desperation for you. That we wouldn't be satisfied with just religion. We wouldn't be satisfied with status quo. We wouldn't be satisfied with uh, just getting by. But there would just be this thing in us that needs more of you. That is desperate for you. That realizes life is challenging and hard and things don't always go your way. And all the more, life in you makes life better. And so I pray that we will believe that life is better with you, Jesus. That everything that we do orients around that. And so we love you and thank you and thank you for today. Thank you for your word and your goodness and your awesome name. Amen. So when you were a kid, do you remember what it is you wanted to be when you grew up? Right? Do you just remember, like, man, I remember I was driven to that. Uh, you know, some people would say, I want to be a carpenter when I grow up. Or some people would say, I wanted to be, uh, you know, a football player or any number of things. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor, something like that. I wanted to be an astronaut. That was going to be my thing. Ground control to major Tom. I wanted to be an astronaut, right? And, and so that, I, I thought, man, that for sure I was going to do that. And then I found out, then you have to be good at math and it fell apart. So, um, <laughs> not an astronaut. You ask the kids here today, the answer may be very different. It's strange. You may have kids that say, uh, I want to be a YouTuber, right? Or I want to be a soccer player. Already a kid's like, I want to be a YouTuber right there. So, um, or I want to be a soccer player. When I was a kid, it was a baseball player. Now it's a soccer player. That might be your thing. You want to be an Uber driver. There's all these jobs that have been created, you know, 
since we were kids as adults, you know, it's like, hey, I, you know, I just, I want to be one of the first colonists on Mars. I mean, when we were kids, we're like, oh, we're not going to Mars, you know? Um, so it's amazing to think about just all the different things that we sort of dream of or think about when it comes to growing up. And yet what I find kind of interesting is that when we think about that question, when it's posed, when we're kids, when we're a kid and we hear it, uh, we think in terms of one of three things. We either think through the idea of it being stuff. When I grow up, I want to be rich. Or we think about job. When I grow up, I want to be a welder. Or we think about role. When I grow up, I want to be a mom or be a dad. See, it's interesting to me when I think about it because our tendency is to go toward those kinds of things. And even as parents, when we're encouraging our kids, we go toward like these functional role, uh, you know, kind of career-based ideas. And strangely, our first answer doesn't often revolve around character. When I grow up, I want to be and pick your value. Pick your virtue, pick, pick that thing that undergirds kind of your functionality in life. Now, I say that because it's interesting to me. Uh, there was a dad several thousand years ago that sat his son down and gave him a, a number of insights for life. He says, I want you to be street wise because when you grow up, I want you to embody certain virtues, certain characteristics, certain qualities of character in your life. And that is more important than a lot of the other things that you do. His name was Solomon. He wasn't necessarily the brightest guy for the wisest guy. He had his own issues and he had his own challenges and his own sins. But as a dad, he wanted to bring this street wise wisdom to his son's life. He sits down and he decides to write this entire uh, kind of treatise on, hey, son, if you do this, you're going to do well. And a lot of those things were these nuggets for wisdom. And what I love about Proverbs, Proverbs is a go-to book for me, which is why we're going to do a series in it for like the next five weeks, just looking at certain ideas in Proverbs. I love it because it is not difficult to understand. It's maybe difficult to do, Right? Being wise is not always the easiest, most efficient, most fun thing to do in life. That's why wisdom is sometimes challenging. But I love it because it's down to earth. It's practical. You read the book of Proverbs and you're like, no, duh. That's what you should do. It's like Mike Rowe wrote the book of Proverbs. Right? You know what I mean? It's just like, uh, work hard because, well, because you're dumb if you don't. Like, it's, it's just like that. The book is completely laden with this practical stuff. And so today, I want to start off in this entire series by looking at street-wise living. How should we live? If we were to try to figure out what's the marquee that we should live by, what's that nugget of wisdom that we need to do and to be to live a truly kind of blessed life, what is that thing that we should do to live the blessed life? Now, if you have your Bible or your Bible app and you have a connection here, actually, at this point, you're awesome. And you can turn to the book of Proverbs. We're going to look at one verse today. Chapter 21, verse 21. Chapter 21, verse 21. And, and what you're going to see here is uh, we're to seek two core disciplines, which then when you do that, kind of expand into three awesome dividends for life, right? So it's a very simple little nugget here. And I love its simplicity, it says, whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life. And the NIV says prosperity and honor. So two core disciplines that then roll into three awesome experiences or dividends. And again, why I love this is its simplicity. We can all memorize this today. Literally, by the time you leave this tent, you could have this verse memorized, right? And in Awana, we would give you a little, a little jewel in your crown for that if you memorized it. And, and simplicity is helpful, right? Like I think about it when I go to Starbucks, that is not simple. Like we roll into the drive through at, at, at Starbucks and I just automatically look at my wife and like, unless you all want waters in this car, you better lean over me, right? Unless you all want coffee with cream and that's all, right? You better lean over and you just do the ordering, you know, because it's going to go a lot easier that way because as soon as I get all the orders, I'm like, I don't know about half this and that and tall and skinny and I don't know, even confused waters, right? So, so simple is good. This is coffee creamer stuff. These are the things that you want to do in life. So what are the two disciplines in this section? Well, the first thing is there should be this, this drive for the word righteousness, righteousness, 
And, and I think sometimes we see that as like a fancy Christian word. You know what I mean? Like, oh, now we got to really unpack the depths of righteousness. What is righteous all about? And sometimes we think, well, righteous is about being moral. Or righteousness is about being uh, kind of fundamentally good in your ethics. And sometimes righteous is even about indignation, right? Righteous is like, no, I am severe and swift on what it is. I believe there is this conviction behind my righteousness. And we tend to drive the word in that direction. And there's certainly room for that in this particular word, right? Be good, be moral, even be indignant. But originally, the word literally meant to walk a straight path wisely or right wise was actually its etymology its original word and then we kind of tinkered with it a little bit so to walk a straight path wisely so here's this dad mike Rowe, talking to his kids sitting him down saying here's what i want for your life right you're going to grow up with some privilege you're going to have some challenges in that privilege and so with that i want you to make sure that you set goals in your life and you take the best the smartest the godliest the wisest route from here to there, right? So whatever it takes to get to that place, you want to do that in the wisest, most righteous way possible. Honoring Christ, being severely dependent on God to take you to those places. Like that's how you want to do this. Now it's very easy in life to go, well, if uh, the goal is this and there is this truly right and wise way to do it, but uh, in the midst of that, I'm going to have to maybe suffer a little bit. In the midst of that, I might have to face some criticism. In the midst of that, it may be hard to own up to some stuff. We, we have a tendency when we start to do that to, to then go, well, but if I kind of go around those barriers, it's going to make it go better for me, right? If I take the long route, but around those challenging things instead of doing the next right thing, if I do kind of a sidestep to the next right thing, but eventually I'm going to get there, right? I'd go, maybe, yeah. We might get there. But the long road is almost always the hardest road, right? You, you read every story in the Bible where things went south. Like you think about like God's people, right? They're in Egypt. Life's terrible. God's like, I'm going to take you back home to where you belong. That is a road trip of three weeks that took 40 years. And God's like, I, if you just did the right wise thing, if you just trusted me and honored me and sought me and longed for me and obeyed me, man, we're there in three weeks. But instead, it was months, it was years, it was decades. Because it wasn't just the right wise path. What this is ultimately telling us is that we are to live our life with a filter that says do the next right thing. Just do the next right thing. Every 15 minutes, let that just kind of pop up in your HUD display. Do the next right thing. When, when you have a problem at work, do the next right thing. When you have a problem in your marriage, right, where there's tension, just do the next right thing. When you have a challenge with your kids or with your parents, do the next right thing. Whatever the next right thing is, you step into that and you step into that believing God has given us the best way for living by saying, do the next right thing. See, because that's what it means to be right wise. And we don't just do this with our decisions. We also want to do it with our dispositions, right? So when we do the next right thing, we don't want to go like, fine, I'll do the next right thing. Right? We don't, like, that's tempting. I'm going to be bitter doing the next right thing. I'm going to be ready to point out, see, I did the next right thing. It doesn't pay off. Waiting for it to blow up. Or to defend why it doesn't really work, but to do it anyway because God tells me because he's a big killjoy, right? There's any number of ways that we can be difficult in the next right thing. But this is where part of wisdom is saying, I do both the decision of wisdom and the disposition, right? You think about the fruit of the spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. I mean, this list of things that are our disposition by the spirit. That is about uh, true righteousness, right? Righteousness isn't just a function it is this sense of connectedness to God's heart and our heart, living it out in a daily way to bring change to our world. So Solomon says, son, be righteous. But at the same time, he says another thing. He says also, focus on kindness. Kindness. The world has a lot of smart people, has a lot of strong people, has a lot of opinionated people. I know that's hard to believe. Um, but a lot of opinionated people. But you know what the world really needs more of is kind people. Kindness is needed. Kindness is needed in daily affairs. Kindness is needed on social media, on social media, on social media. Kindness is needed again on social media. 
Kindness is needed in the grocery store. Kindness is needed. Oh, here's the tough one on the 405. Kindness <laughs> is needed, right? It's needed. Peace sign, not that other one. Peace, right? So like kindness, and kindness is powerful, man. I, I, I think that's why when Solomon is telling his kid, here's how you should live, he puts it in the top two nuggets, right? And what kindness means is doing to others, ready? Doing to others like their family. That's its original kind of background meaning, doing to others like their family. Now, I know some of you are like, oh man, you don't know my family, right? Like it's like wet willies and wedgies and pushing buttons and, you know, fighting over like the last piece or last cookie, whatever. No, no. In the most ideal way, it's being family. Treating everybody like they're a brother or everybody like they are a sister, right? It's care for care's sake. And it's really caring for people, whether they agree with you or don't. It's really easy for us to not be kind to people that are not kind to us. As followers of Jesus, he did this really, really awful thing. He put it on our shoulders, this whole notion that says, if you have an enemy, you do good to them. You love them. If they curse you, you bless them. Like he just really threw it on our shoulders. Like, man, if you're signing up to follow me, you're signing up to be kind to people who may not be kind to you. And yet it's a conspiracy of kindness. The kingdom drives forward and changes lives when we are kind. And so we strive in this kindness, in the strength of the spirit, because that's a spirit thing. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. It's not us white knuckling kindness. Like I'm going to be nice on the 405, right? It's, no, I, I want the, the spirit to do this in me. And so I want to be kind to others. There's a line from the movie Wonder. And it's this proverb that's in the movie. And it says, if you have the choice between being right or being kind, choose kind. And, and I like the quote, but I, th I think it's incomplete. And, and so I was thinking about this week and I'm like, you know, actually we should rewrite it to say, uh, do what is right by being kind. And by being kind to others, you are doing what is right. Well, we don't have to set these against one another, Right. We can bolt them together as Christians because part of what we have to recall about righteousness as a Christian and as you bolt it to kindness is that the only way we stand righteous in the sight of Christ was the kindness of God sending Christ to make us righteous. We do not make ourselves righteous. We do not have any room to march around in our world and act as though our chest is puffed out and we've got it all figured out and therefore we are righteous. No, we are righteous only by the grace of Jesus. So all the more because we're so humbled by grace, we should be kind, right? And notice it says here, not just to be kind or to be righteous, but to pursue it, to chase it, to hunt it, right? To have a single-minded focus. Think about little kids playing soccer, right? If you have any children in soccer, you know how this works. There are positions in little kid soccer, but as soon as the ball is on the field, the ball's the, the objective. All the positions fall apart. All the kids just chase the ball. Every kid chases the ball. Doesn't you're the goalie, man. Don't run after the ball. You know, and stay at the goal. No, I'm running after the ball. Everybody wants the ball. Every kid just goes after the ball. It's like a dog pile to the ball, right? They're in pursuit. And then once they get to the ball, we gotta get it into the goal, but the goalie's with us. What's gonna you know? So that's how it works. That's a single-minded pursuit. That is a devotion to it. And so even Jesus said, Man, seek first the kingdom and its righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Like he knew. Make that your pursuit. And so this dad wants above all, not college, career, or cash for his kids. He wants character. He wants character because he knows when you seek this kind of character in the name of God through Christ and the power of the spirit, you see the dividends. What's he say really fast? First, he says, from this, you have life. Life, right? You'll have a sense of fulfillment in it that you wouldn't have otherwise. The most fulfilled people are righteous and kind. Deep down inside, that's where they're at. He also says prosperity, which is a sense of contentedness through life. That does not mean, man, I'm going to be filthy rich. I'm going to win the Jesus lotto, right? Uh, prosperity is, is a thing of internal, like, man, whether I'm rich or poor, I have everything or nothing. I, I, I'm good because Christ, he stabilizes me. That's Paul's whole thing in Philippians. And the last, he says, you will have honor which is you will have a good reputation in the eyes of those through the duration of your life. And so he says, man, if there's anything I want for my kid, 
It's for them to have life and prosperity and honor, but the road to that is going to be righteousness and kindness. See, our society and our system, it markets to seeking fulfillment in unfulfilling ways, but Scripture says here's a simpler way, a more stable way, a more secure way of enjoying wisdom for life. I want us to go ahead and pray right now as we um, kind of let this sink in, right? Think in how we can do our lives in a way that's different, in a way that is wise, in a way that is wise through the Spirit who brings that wisdom. And so right now, I just want to pray that, Jesus, you would do that in us. This is a very simple little nugget. I mean, in some ways, I'm, I'm grateful. It's the short little message for a short little verse with short little ideas that have incredible impact if we just took them seriously. And I say that from my life. Like, it's just so easy to get caught up in all the other things and, and to not say, man, I'm going to make these two ideas my objective, righteousness and wisdom through kindness and pursuing you in that. And from that, you give the dividends of stability and longevity and encouragement. And so I pray that you remind us and I pray that you commit us. I pray that you drive us to yourself Again, no white knuckle in religion, but rather just this need and want of you. I pray that even as we come to the table of communion today and, and, and we think about what you've done for us and how we remember what you've done. And again, what have you done? You've given us righteousness by your grace. That is why we are to be kind then. It is so undeserved. And so we love you and thank you for your grace bestowed on us and your good and perfect name. Amen.